It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Adam Miller is the author of a book called Letters to a Young Mormon. It's a little book, but it packs a powerful punch. In this episode, Miller's here to talk about the new second expanded edition of the book. I've known Adam for a number of years now, so this interview is a little bit more informal than some of the other episodes. Adam's a professor of philosophy at Collin College in McKinney, Texas, and a member of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He also recently delivered an institute guest lecture here at Brigham Young University. You'll be able to catch a recording of that lecture in the coming weeks. But before we get to Adam, I also wanted to thank listener Rachel Ann. She took time out of her presumably busy schedule to rate and review the Maxwell Institute podcast in iTunes. Among other things, she said, I love listening to this podcast during my morning workouts. It gives me so much to think about every day. It's broadening my horizons and helping me to see scripture and daily life in new, creative, spiritually uplifting ways. I'm looking forward to future episodes. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Rachel. And we'll also invite everybody to stick around after the interview with Adam in this episode. We've got a special little mini episode tacked on to the end with Janice Johnson, a visiting scholar here at the Maxwell Institute. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. And here's Adam Miller talking about letters to a young Mormon. Adam Miller, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast again. It is a pleasure to be on the podcast, Blair. My children love the podcast, <laughs> and they will think I'm a boss for being back on again. Yeah, did they? They for the first interview, did they actually listen to you? And they have never listened to me on the podcast. They didn't want to hear it, but they especially love the intro music. Oh, good. Thank you very much, and and hello to the Miller kids. There's Samantha and Joshua. Do you, do you keep your kids' names secret? Uh, some. Some uh, people are like, ah, oh, I never want people to know about my kids. So, um, you already said Joshua, so he's out. Joshua's out. <laughs> uh, I probably shouldn't mention Nathan either. Okay, too late for that now as well. I, guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I don't, I don't post things about them on Facebook, yeah. etc. But well, um, hello to all of them, and uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, we're talking about letters to young Mormon, and that's what we talked about last time as well. We did an interview when the first edition came out. And you may have talked about this in other places, but it might be useful for people to hear a little bit about how the second edition came about, like why a second edition? Well, I think the big impetus for the second edition was the chance to co-publish it with uh, not just the Maxwell Institute, but with Deseret Book, right, so that we could potentially reach a much bigger audience. Yeah, they have a pretty good size They've audience. They've got a pretty good sized yeah. audience, Deseret <laughs> Book. Uh, and that, was, that, I think, was the big impetus. Uh, and along the way, it gave me a chance to flesh out and clarify some parts of the original book and uh, add two new letters to the book. As you were going back through the book, do you remember anything in particular that you were glad you were able to revisit and revise? I should let people know, too, at the time I, I was working as a co-editor on the Living Faith series, mm -hmm. and so I, I was kind of involved in that uh, as well. And there aren't, there aren't a bunch of huge changes in this book. We should make that clear. No. The two new letters are obviously the biggest change. Uh, there's a new preface and then some revisions throughout, pretty light revisions here mm -hmm. and there. But and any of those particular revisions that you thought, oh, I'm glad I got to do that. Not a lot of, not every author gets a chance to do that with a book, so. No, yeah. I made a couple changes to the chapter on sin to clarify, help clarify the role that I think potentially positive role that stories play in our religious experience, so long as we don't let them take over that experience and become a kind of idol. What that is we the worship. role that stories play? What is that? Well, I think stories are an inevitable part of being a human being. Part of what makes a human being a human being is that we tell stories to help us understand ourselves. But when we get sucked into the trap of thinking that our stories are more important than the thing that they're trying to describe, uh, then we end up in pretty tough spots, uh, often pretty frustrated, pretty disappointed. What's and an example I, of like a story that you're talking about? When you're talking about someone having a story, what do you mean? Like like someone, what they think about who they are or what direction their life is going in or what? Yeah, especially the kinds of stories that we tell ourselves uh, as a way of understanding who we are and what matters to us and what our goals are and what our expectations are. Those stories are really important part of being a human being and they bind us together and they can give us kind of direction and purpose. 
but they can also be a kind of trap that we get stuck in uh, because another basic feature of being a human being is that reality is going to pretty consistently fail to match up uh, in neat ways with the stories that we're trying to tell, especially about ourselves. And that, that kind of thing can lead to frustration or alienation or discouragement and these, these types. It's, it seems like you're concerned about some of the emotions that can grow out of the stories that we tell. Yeah, that's part of it. Uh, and I think a big part of it has to do with the way that uh, we end up preferring the stories we want our lives to tell over the actual life that God is giving us. And in that sense, preferring my stories about my life to the life that God is actually giving is a way of rejecting God and distancing myself from Him. Uh, and that, I think, is the real root danger in the end of getting trapped in uh, prioritizing our stories over the actual stuff of life. It was interesting to me that that was one of the parts that you added additional clarification for because you might remember um, Elder Christofferson, one of the LDS Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, uh, quoted from Letters to Young Mormon in a devotional, which ended up in the Ensign, and that was actually the point that he lifted from that, was the idea of what our stories are versus kind of uh, looking to Christ rather than just clinging to our own stories. Yeah. I think that the trick is, as with many things, to neither fall in love with your stories to the extent that you make an idol of them, uh, while neither uh, trying to get rid of them altogether. Right? There's a kind of value, uh, a kind of necessity to the stories that we tell each other about who we are and what matters to us uh, that we shouldn't underestimate, while at the same time stories have to keep their proper place as as just a way of talking about the things that matter to us, not something to be substituted for the things themselves. It seems to be a pretty difficult needle to thread, though, because so many people are very goal-oriented and, and, and driven by ideas of what the future can look like. And, and in order to get to a particular desired future, we, we have to kind of have benchmarks and, and, and see a path there. And at the same time, you're saying that, that that's a good thing, but you're also cautioning about the pitfalls of that. And it seems like a hard, a really hard needle to thread. Yeah, and to the degree that you thread it, it's one that you have to thread over and over. Like it's and almost over you don't have a choice, right? Because you can't control the outcome all the way. Yeah, and I think that, that that ends up being a really important part of what a religious life looks like, is that though I may have goals I'm interested in pursuing, nonetheless, as I pursue them, I'm always willing to surrender them in favor of what God is offering instead. In your lecture that you delivered here um, at Brigham Young University, you talked about moral creativity. Is that connected to this line of thought as well? And maybe explain a little bit about what you mean by moral creativity. Well, I think moral creativity doesn't have to do, first of all, with uh, creating new morals. It has to do instead, it's a way to try to describe the ways in which being moral depends on our finding ways to be creative in our relationships with other people, especially, so that we don't get trapped uh, in these kinds of uh, stalemates where uh, neither of us are capable of doing anything new or reaching out to each other or opening new avenues for justice or mercy or new kinds of deeper, more meaningful relationships with each other. There's, there's a kind of creativity that's necessary on our part to not get angry in a thoughtless way when things happen that make us angry, right? We have to, we have to uh, seize the moment uh, and not act like a robot and instead do something new, surprising. I think that's the kind of thing Jesus is constantly urging uh, and modeling in the New Testament. Find a way to respond differently to people. Find a way to respond in a way that might be surprising and reconfigure the situation so that something new can happen and we're not just stuck in the same patterns of, of frustration and, and violence and dissatisfaction. Yeah, you made this point about um, when Christ is talking about if someone sues you for your coat, I think give them your cloak also, or if someone wants you to walk a mile, go with them twain. And the way that that's typically interpreted differs from what you offer. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I focused especially on Jesus' saying uh, that if someone asks you to go a mile, go with them, twain, right? 
go the extra mile is the popular version of that Jesus saying. And the popular reading of that saying is that what Jesus means is for us to work harder and do more, right? Go the extra mile. Be better for some, yeah. yeah. Help someone more than is expected. And as far as that goes, that's, that's good advice. Uh, but Walter Wink, who is a, a New Testament scholar, uh, has argued, and I think pretty persuasively, that in the context of Jesus' world, he's after something different. But in the context of Jesus' world, uh, where uh, the Jews were occupied by a foreign Roman power, by the Roman Empire, by Roman soldiers, uh, what was at stake was a very specific... Uh, proscription against Roman soldiers being allowed to force people to carry their packs for more than a mile. This was written into Roman military code, uh, right? That they couldn't force people to carry their packs for more than a mile. Uh, so what you have is a kind of scenario where an occupying power can force the people they're oppressing to carry their pack for a mile, but that's it. And Jesus, Wink argues, is outlining a kind of strategy here for forcing the Roman soldier to not respond to you simply as someone who he, who he can oppress, but as his own equal by your, in a sense, refusing to give him his pack back and going <laughs> an extra, take, carrying it for an extra mile. So you really, put the, you really put the Roman soldier in a kind of bind, right? Either has to forcefully take his pack from you, in which he's, uh, in essence, uh, forced to treat you as a kind of equal, right? Because no, no, give me back my pack, right? <laughs> as, uh, uh, in which he's, he's forced to importune you instead of you importuning him. Uh, or he has to risk letting you carry it for him another mile of your own volition and the possible consequences that come from that. So Wink argues that what what Jesus is what Jesus is aiming for here uh, is a kind of strategy that would force the Roman soldier to not respond to you in those kind of automatic robotic ways, but that would reconfigure your relationship to him and and open a moment of kind of moral creativity in which you and the soldier could look each other eye to eye for at least a moment and be equals. So since most of us aren't dealing with Roman soldiers, then how would you apply that kind of thing in everyday life today? Well, I think it's it's not hard to find examples in the course of our daily lives, maybe especially with our own family members where we get stuck in kind of particular patterns of relationships where uh, my child acts one way and then I automatically respond to them in my predictable dad way, <laughs> right? Uh, and there's... And, uh, there's these kinds of uh, patterns that we tend to get stuck in in our relationships with other people where uh, that prevent us from actually connecting with each other, right? That prevent me from actually seeing my son and what he needs or for my son seeing that I actually care for him and given the kind of response uh, I'm offering him. Where if I could, if I could just step back for, for just a moment, just occupy a kind of beat of silence before responding automatically and thoughtlessly and allow allow myself to to be just a little bit creative in how I responded to my kids or to my wife or uh, to a student or to a coworker, right? That the, the relationship could unfold in a very different way and open on to a kind of care and possible connection that uh, our typical frozen patterns of relationship don't allow for so i take it you're perfect at this yourself right like you absolutely got, so now that you're able to tell people about it only because you're able to do it all the time as a philosopher <laughs> everything i'm able to talk about yeah you can take for granted yeah that. <laughs> that's right that's exactly right and speaking of being a philosopher i've heard you joke with other people last night at at written vision in provo there was an event and, and one of the people there with you mentioned that he had now decided to be a philosophy major and you laughed you apologized and and asked oh you know don't blame me for what's coming down the road and i you know it's a funny joke but when you get down to it we look at education as something that often leads to uh, employment people are thinking about uh, how they're going to support families or you know that sort of thing and, and getting a philosophy degree might not seem to be very helpful in that way so i wanted to hear some ideas or thoughts from you about the utility, the usefulness of getting a degree in philosophy and, and what that's done for you. 
it's not a super useful thing to get a degree, <laughs> uh, especially, especially graduate degrees in philosophy. I mean, there's a lot of useful things you can do with uh, an undergraduate degree in philosophy, which are like going to medical school or law school. But basically, the only thing you're prepared... Did, sorry, did you think you were going to do that when you initially started? No, for me, uh, I mean, my story, is, my story is a little different. It's a little, it's a little funnier than that. My undergraduate degree is not in philosophy. My undergraduate degree uh, from BYU is in comparative literature. Literature, that's right, I right? remember. So that... So you in switched the moment, over later. Yeah, so that in the moment when I decided to do my graduate work in philosophy... That struck my parents as a moment in which I was growing up and becoming practical. This was a practical it was more move. Practical it was than, more practical than comparative literature. Apologies pra to the comparative instead of literature studying people. poetry for the rest of my life, I was going to do something more serious and practical, like studying philosophy. <laughs> but unless you're studying poetry, you're not going to be able to make that same kind of move. And studying philosophy is going to look less practical. So you're, it's probably not going to work for most people. Were you following in your parents' footsteps at all? What kind of education and interest did they have? Uh, my parents are both teachers. Uh, so my, education was My important. mother was, in fact, my own fourth grade teacher. Oh, okay. Uh, my father was an elementary school teacher, went back and got uh, graduate degrees and master's and a PhD in educational administration, and then worked as a principal and a superintendent. And my father was my high school principal. So my mother was my fourth grade teacher and my father was my <laughs> Did you ever have to go to the principal. principal's office? I went to the principal's office all the time, especially yeah, right. for lunch money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, uh, I would often pester the principal to let me in the high school gym after hours, things like that. So there yeah. were perks. There tended to be more perks <laughs> to the, but my father being my principal uh, than there were downside. And so they saw this comparative literature guy choosing philosophy, going that route, now, to the young man who talked to you about that, what kind of things would you envision for someone thinking about getting a degree in philosophy that's not an undergraduate degree? Well, the trouble is if you get a graduate degree in philosophy, they're only training you to do one thing, which is to be a professional academic studying philosophy. Yeah. And the real problem with that is that there are literally no jobs. Yeah. Uh, I have a job at a community college uh, in Texas that I've, I've been at for 12 years. There are more than a hundred other philosophers that applied for that job at a community college 10 years ago, mm. 12 years ago. And the job market is worse than it was mm. then uh, for any kind of position at a major university. You're talking two or th you're competing with two or 300 other people for one position. And you're just not, you're just not, your odds are not good. So, I mean, what do you say to contemplative people who take a, a real interest in philosophy? I mean, it's, it's a real luxury to be able to study that and, and to get a degree and, and to become a professor and to work with, with students. And, and what do you tell your students then that they really have a deep interest in philosophy, but also look at some of the practical obstacles they might face if they choose that as a career path? It is a real luxury to be an academic period and maybe to be a philosopher in particular where you have a lot of freedom to roam basically wherever you want to think about whatever you want to think about because everything belongs to the field of philosophy. For me, working at a community college, I work almost exclusively with students who are taking philosophy classes to fulfill general education requirements. So it's pretty rare for me to bump into a student who thinks that they want to even major as an undergraduate in philosophy. So that, that part doesn't come up very often, but I mean, I think I would in general want to make clear to people that to participate in the life of the mind in meaningful and rewarding ways doesn't require you to do that professionally, but that you can have a day job that you also love and feel like you're making a meaningful contribution to the world and go home and read whatever you want at night. I think the internet also helps right? because you can, in some ways it, it's, it can be harmful because there's just such a glut of information and where do you turn? But on the other hand, you can network with other uh, people that maybe are reading the same things or, or um, you can hear about things to read or whatever. So it seems like um, even though it's hard in the field to get positions, it's also an interesting time where a lot of people you can, can find a community, right? You yeah. can find a community of people without a lot of trouble who are willing to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, if that's, contemporary continental philosophy after you're done 
managing a restaurant during the day good for yeah. you you're not going to have a hard time finding people who are willing to talk about that with you and that's that is uh something something pretty new that's adam miller we're talking with him about his new book letters to young mormon it's a second edition co-published by the maxwell institute and deseret book and as i mentioned earlier yesterday we uh you you delivered a lecture at brigham Young university and a lot of students showed up we had to turn some people away I felt really bad about that that we didn't have enough space and I wanted to ask you about this idea of like Mormon celebrity, this idea of sort of becoming a figure that people would recognize your name. And I wanted to know kind of how you felt about that, um, that there are people who know Adam Miller or follow your work and buy the books that you write. You know, and, and I publicize the books that you've done with us, and so I'm kind of in that mix a little bit and thinking about what it means to be putting someone up there like this. And I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I'm glad people buy the books. Uh, I'm glad people are interested in the work that I do. Uh, the little bit of celebrity that has come with it is weird. Uh, it makes me glad to not live in Utah, right? I mean, I can I can come up a couple, uh, you know, I can visit Utah a couple times a year and be Adam Miller for a couple of days, and it's kind of fun, and then go home, right? But if if I had to be Adam Miller all the time, I don't, I don't think I would enjoy it very much. Well, and you're not, you're not Adam Miller at home either, right? No, you're this different no. Adam Miller. No, not very much, not at all. I mean, uh, I think it would be a surprise to most people in my ward that Adam Miller is, quote unquote, Adam Miller. <laughs> <laughs> right in my ward at home, I just, I teach the seventeen-year-old Sunday school class. I've just I've done things like that, just little little things in the ward for as long as we've been in Texas. Uh, but there's a line there's a line too from uh, Epictetus, Stoic philosopher, his his book called The Handbook, uh, that always comes to mind, uh, where Epictetus says, uh, "If other people think you amount to something, distrust yourself." <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's a good, that's a good model for anybody in public life. Yeah, I should take that as your motto. Uh, if other people think you amount to something, distrust yourself. I'm I'm interested to, to hear more about some of the pitfalls of the celebrity Adam Miller. Well, to be honest, I mean, I think I have only uh, any kind of glancing contact <laughs> with celebrity, <laughs> such as it is. Uh, but I mean, I think celebrities, it's it's risky. It's a risky thing. It's easy to lose track of, of what's real and what matters. It's easy to lose track of what kinds of things are actually valuable in our relationships with, with other people. It's easy to fall into the trap of uh, expecting other people to agree with you and being upset when they don't. Uh, from the other side uh, of the story, I think as a culture, both as Americans and also as Mormons, we tend to put people in really difficult spots by painting them into the box of celebrities, in which we have unrealistic expectations uh, of them. Uh, I think that's not uncommon with respect to how we tend to think about our general authorities in the church, the members of the Quorum of the Twelve, the uh, First Presidency. Uh, it's easy to turn them into not people into into kind of celebrity idols in whom we invest our fantasies of kind of moral and religious perfection and then uh, that makes it difficult for them and when they turn out to be people like the rest of us uh, called by God but people like the rest of us nonetheless then there's a lot of room for uh, disappointment and frustration there it's unnecessary I think huh. well as you said, I mean, you're not you're not a super super rock star, right? You kind of have you have a little bit of celebrity status in terms of their your your name's known in in some circles of thoughtful Mormons who pay attention to some of the stuff that that comes out of BYU or the Maxwell Institute or places like this. But I thought it would be fun to have you uh, have you read some of these one star reviews that you've got. Um, and uh, <laughs> so I've got the, this one's from someone called Rebecca. Uh, so yeah, here's the. So the first is, couple lines, you don't have to read the whole thing, but so this is like mean tweets on yes, Jimmy Kimmel one. Yep. So you're Jimmy Kimmel and I'm Anne Hathaway. Yes, that's right. All right. This is this is a one star review for, of uh, 
Is this of one of the books in particular? Yeah, it's letters. This is a, a one-star review. Do you have a lot of one-star reviews of like each book? <laughs> I'm sure there are. <laughs> I'm sure there are some. I appreciate the engagement. Yes. That, that, that it manifests. Yes. I, even if people disagree with me. I mean, I've always taken it for granted as a philosopher that disagreement is the highest compliment you can pay yeah, someone. You, yeah, you got them in talking about it. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. This is this is a one star review of Letters to a Young Mormon. Quote: uh, I read this for book club, and it's not something I would have picked up otherwise. The idea was good enough, but I started subtracting stars every time the smug, pretentious voice became overly preachy, or the metaphors glaringly overwrought. That's, yeah. Well, she better not try the audiobook then, because then she, she'll also hear, like, not just reading the smug, but, like, the, she'll hear it too, so. Well, I mean, I spent, I spent years and years of training in school and as a professor, <laughs> uh, you know, cultivating that kind of smug and pretentious it's earned. tone it's of voice pretentiousness uh it's like the way that you know once you have a once you're a doctor you don't have to bother making your signature look like it spells anything anymore yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same kind of earned who's this who's this next one uh you don't have to say his full name well there's only a first name here it's scott's review oh good also one star of letters to young mormon uh i was only able to get through three chapters of this book it's a short book too. that's only like six pages <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't make it far. No. Uh, I was only able to get through three chapters of this book, so it's possible that it got better. However, the parts that I read were so overwritten and needlessly complex and ambiguous that I'm not sure what teenage kid would glean anything from those chapters. <laughs> uh, I'm a little bit sympathetic. Yeah. There's, there's one more one. This is probably my favorite one-star review. It's from, from Marva. And this, this is a review that came out back just a couple months after the first edition came out. So this is one star from Marva. <laughs> one star from Marva. Uh, letters to Young Mormon. Quote, This book has great information for all to read. My husband and I have read it several times. It's shortened to the point. One star. One star. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Marva, if you're listening. Uh, thank you very much. And by the way, Marva, you can change it to a five star review. They Amazon lets you do that if that's what she meant. If, but maybe she did mean one star. Maybe I know she, she did. She might have incredibly high standards. Yeah, simple she, and to the point. That gets you one. You've that, earned one. You've earned, <laughs> exactly. That's Adam Miller. We're talking about letters to a young Mormon. Um, I wanted to switch gears here a little bit and talk about the idea of of disciple scholarship, the relationship between your own personal faith and the work that you do, because you've published books that aren't, don't touch on Mormonism. They're probably informed somewhat by your faith or by your background, obviously, but uh, you've published books that aren't written geared towards Mormons or about Mormonism. And then you've also spent a lot of time on books for the, for Mormon readers as well. So how do you conceive of the idea of disciple scholarship? This is a, a term that Elder Neil A. Maxwell coined to talk about the relationship between someone's scholarship and their faith. Yeah, all of my substantial professional work as a scholar just fits broadly into the category of philosophy of religion and doesn't have anything to do with Mormonism in particular. Uh, but still, I think for me as a scholar, especially working in the field of philosophy of religion, whether or not that work is explicitly connected to Mormonism, uh, it's not hard for me to see the connections between the research that I do into the lived experience of religion or a kind of phenomenology of grace or what it looks like to uh, engage in contemplative practices and the connections between spirituality and boredom, right? These kinds of questions that I take up in my scholarly work, it's not hard for me to see what kind of connection they have to lived religion on the ground, even especially maybe in my own life. And for me, I think a lot of being a disciple scholar turns on doing the kind of work that prepares the ground for other people to continue to do similar kinds of work. I mean, I think there are, I think there are kind of two different models for the disciple scholar. Right? One model for the disciple scholar is uh, the warrior who goes out and does battle with the enemies of 
the faith, right? And defends the church and the uh, gospel and the tradition from uh, false accusations and spurious claims and bad research and sets the record straight. That's kind of one model, I think, for the disciple scholar. Uh, but that, that's never been that's never been for me the kind of uh, model that I was primarily interested in. I think the other model for the disciple for the disciple scholar is uh, the model of the farmer, who is kind of patiently cultivating ground and planting seeds and engaging in conversation and uh, gathering research and uh, giving the kind of work that we do as scholars the room and space to grow and the time and patience to see if it's going to be worthwhile to us or to our children or grandchildren in the end. Uh, and I think both of those both of those kinds of work have their place, but I've always been a lot more of a farmer than a warrior. What about the pitfalls of either of those? I mean, with the warrior side of things, are there ways that that can go uh, go astray with the with the farmer type model? Are there things that that can miss out on? You talk about a, a certain need for different types. How about some of the per- potential negative side effects of either approach. What are some of the possible downsides? What's some of the good that can still be done? Well, I think one possible downside to the warrior model is that it's easy to get stuck in patterns of pugilistic give and take, right? It's easy to get entrenched uh, in a certain way of seeing things, and in particular, in a certain way of seeing other people as the enemy. That, in lots of ways, I think runs counter to the basic thrust of the gospel, which is to find ways to to love the enemy and to refuse to let them, in the end, be your enemy. So, in one sense, there there's a there's a time and place for uh, setting the record straight and not letting people get away with saying things about the church that are false and harmful and untrue. But on the other hand, I think there's a real danger uh, in being primarily occupied with that and and to falling into the trap of of always relating to people who don't belong to our side of the fence as the enemy. Um, The farmer, on the other hand, I think one real risk that the farmer takes is that it requires... It requires a lot of time and patience to see what's going to grow and what's going to be worthwhile and what's going, what kind of research is going to be useful uh, or not, what kind of conversations will or won't bear fruit with people who uh, agree or disagree with us in varying ways. Uh, you have to be willing to, to allow a difference of opinion and be willing to engage in conversation with people who disagree with you without immediately bringing the conversation to a halt. And so there's there's a kind of risk inherent in engaging in that long-term work as well. That's Adam Miller. We're talking today about Letters to a Young Mormon, a new book from the Maxwell Institute and Deseret Book. Adam's also written other books, including translations of scriptures, kind of his own back pocket translations. Um, he's done one of uh, Romans. Paraphrases, I would I would say. Paraphrases, probably more accurate, say. yeah call them modest paraphrases even uh well or is the, that just the modifier one? changes oh okay uh, so yeah tell me tell I've me done, each i've of done these. three of these little paraphrases i think of underappreciated books of scripture uh one is a little paraphrase of the book of romans paul's letter to the romans and that is subtitled as uh, an urgent paraphrase uh, i did a, <laughs> a little paraphrase of the book of ecclesiastes uh, in the Old Testament, uh, subtitled A Blunt Paraphrase. Because it's a blunt book. Ecc- because Ecclesiastes is famously yeah. dark and pessimistic. You're all going to die and nothing matters. <laughs> nothing matters. It's yeah, that's vain. kind of the whole book. <laughs> it's the whole book, yeah. Uh, it's really something else. And uh, this most recent one is uh, a paraphrase of what's sometimes called uh, the Song of Songs or what's often in the King James, I think, is referred to as the Song of Solomon, uh, which is basically Hebrew love poetry, uh, which I think some church leaders in the past have urged members to just staple the pages shut and not be (laughs) exposed to this kind of erotic biblical content. 
Uh, but I offer here, I say, a, a modest paraphrase of Solomon's Song of Songs. Modest in the sense of modesty, then? or Well, being like, a little tongue-in-cheek, I think, both in that, you know, there's not, I mean, it's... It's just a little it's, thing. It's, it's modest a, in my yeah. attempt to, to, to render parts of it. <laughs> but also, yeah, kind of playing around with the fact that, you know, we... This is a this is a Mormon a Mormon approved version of <laughs> <laughs> the song of songs. I I tone I tone I tone it down a little bit in some places, uh, so that it's slightly less explicit than it is uh, in Hebrew. But I try to let the spirit of the thing come through. Do you find much religious devotion in that? Because that's one of the complaints that I know people have had is that this this is a book that doesn't lend itself well to to sort of what people think of as being inspirational. But then there's a long history of interpretation of the book that allegorizes it and and uh, and treats it very religiously. So does your paraphrase do the same thing and treat it religiously, or is it more treated just straightforward love song type stuff? It's true on the face of it that the Song of Songs is kind of an aberration in the biblical canon because it never mentions God. <laughs> in the entire yeah in the entire song of songs like his name doesn't even come up no. like god doesn't come up pharaoh's in there uh pharaoh's in there solomon's in there there's little hints and allusions to different aspects of uh, israelite history uh but god never comes up so on the face of it uh, it doesn't seem to have much to do with god but i think if there's a part of the christian tradition that should be prepared uh to see the relationship between a man and a woman, especially maybe the erotic uh, sexual aspect of that relationship as being uh, potentially ground zero for not just a connection with another person, but with the divine, it probably ought to be us as Mormons. On the back of the book, they've got uh, Professor James Faulkner from Brigham Young University talking about how this particular paraphrase of the Song of Solomon, uh, he says it unveils the tender and sensual love poetry of the ancient book in plain English, and by doing that, it reminds us of the sacredness of embodied human love, giving power to prophetic metaphor. When you started this particular project of Song of Solomon, is, were you aiming for that already, or did you just dive in without knowing what direction it would take? Uh, I kind of dove in without being clear about what direction it would take. I mean, part of the work that I do with these paraphrases is a chance to spend time with books that I want to spend time understanding better. Uh, and that was partly true here with the Song of Songs, with the Song of Solomon. One of the other things that I think that's potentially noteworthy and of interest about the Song of Songs uh, is that uh, there's some scholarly consensus that it may have been written by a woman, the Song of Songs, which means... As far as I can tell, uh, it's the only book in the Mormon canon of scripture that might have been written by a woman and maybe uh, especially deserves some attention as a result. Do you think these projects are going to continue? Do you plan to do more paraphrases of scripture or do you feel like that's kind of uh, run its course? Uh, I think I might do more of them. I don't have, I haven't settled on, on what to do next. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. Do you have any ideas? Is there, is there a short list of you said these are kind of the overlooked books that you're actually kind of interested in. Or, I mean, how many more of those are there? The Old Testament has a lot of books that people don't spend a lot of time in. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so is it going to be kind of a lot of Old Testament stuff? or? Uh, I'm really not sure. I mean, I almost, instead of doing the Song of Songs, I almost uh, attempted to break Isaiah up into three or four parts uh, and do do some of those. Uh, rendering a, a kind of paraphrase of Isaiah in plainer English that might make him more accessible. Because I think a lot like Paul, uh, a lot like Paul's epistles in the New Testament, the King James versions of Isaiah and Paul's epistles are gorgeous and beautiful, but basically unreadable hmm. <laughs> in terms of their in terms of their sense, yeah, yeah, in terms of comprehending the basic point that they're making. Uh, and so I think there could be a lot of value to a kind of uh, plain English paraphrase of the book of Isaiah, maybe especially for Mormons, for whom Isaiah is absolutely pivotal to understanding what's going on in the book of Mormon and how the restoration picks up and transforms our understanding of the Bible. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. That turned out to feel a little too ambitious for a little side project. <laughs> <laughs> so I just did the Song of Songs instead.
He took the easy road. I did. By choosing the love poetry that uh, once most again, Mormons have probably never read. Once again, I chose the easy road of uh, <laughs> canonical erotica. <laughs> yeah. The only real and <laughs> the only real and extended example of of that. So yeah, and I should mention too the latest uh, of these paraphrases that you've done was published by BCC Press. It's a new independent press uh, from the blog by Common Consent, and people can check out their offerings at bccpress.org. We're talking with Adam Miller about his books, including the new letters to Young Mormon. And before we go, I want to this this interview is a little more buttoned down. Obviously, Adam, um, you're you're doing several interviews on letters to Young Mormon, so I I wanted to kind of go off the beaten path a little bit in this interview. So I advise people if they're interested in knowing more specifically about letters to Young Mormon, you can either listen to the earlier interview that we did with Adam. Uh, several years ago, or check out some of the other podcasts that he's going to be on, including uh, Mormon Land uh, from the Salt Lake Tribune. Uh, and what other shows are you scheduled on? I know you're going to be on Doug Wright's, Doug Wright's radio show. show. On KSL, yeah. Uh, and, and in addition to Doug Wright, then also the Mormon News Report, I believe, as well. Uh, yes. Before we go, uh, I also wanted to say you have another book coming out from the Maxwell Institute and Deseret book. Uh, it's coming out in May. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called An Early Resurrection. So, Give us the thirty-second synopsis of that. When that comes out, we'll do a we'll do an interview on that book and and talk about it more in depth. And I'm going to try to bring some other people in on the discussion for that one, uh, some other visiting scholars at the institute, and get a, a little roundtable discussion going on for that one. But uh, in the meantime, give us an idea of what that book's about. Following up to letters to a young Mormon. Well, the book is called "An Early Resurrection: Life in Christ Before You Die," and the basic image at the heart of the book. Uh, is that living a new life in Christ involves handling time in a different way than we do as the natural man or the natural woman. But our tendency is to live time from front to back, from beginning to end, to wait in the present moment for the salvation that we hope will come in the future. Like when Jesus returns, or like when Jesus returns, or after I've died yeah, and yeah. passed through the judgment and bar, we're then for that, if we're then good finally, now, then maybe later, far yeah. into the future, I'll be saved. Yeah. Uh, but I think a central part of living a Christian life involves my willingness, as we see in something like the ordinance of baptism, my willingness to let my death happen early, to be buried in the waters of baptism, to die, and then to begin my new resurrected life before I've even left mortality. There's a very real and important sense in which, as the Book of Mormon prophets uh, like to say, that we have to look forward to Christ as if he had already come, and live our lives as if we had already been saved, so that we can find here and now uh, the kind of redemption that we've been looking for, so that we can learn how to live here and now in the presence of God, and not just hope for it at some later date. So in some ways, you're kind of comparing us more to the early Nephites in the Book of Mormon than to the ones who lived after, uh, you know, 3 Nephi 11, Jesus visits uh, the people there, and we kind of situate ourselves after that because we come, according to the timeline, we're after that. You're saying we could relate more to the people before Christ came in the Book of Mormon. Well, the bulk of the Book of Mormon is dedicated to those people who lived before Christ's arrival. Uh, and taking them as an example of what it means to live a Christian life, which is ironic because they're living Christian lives before Christ, before there are any Christians. And so in this sense, I think the Book of Mormon really models something very important for us about a Christian life, the way that we don't have to wait for Christ to have come, for Christ to be part of our lives. We don't have to wait uh, for the next life to live in the presence of God, but the, what p- part of what God wants is to shuffle that future salvation into our present experience uh, so that we can be liberated to go about the work of loving and caring for other people instead of worrying about our own salvation. So you see, for instance, in the Book of Mormon, you see the people anticipating Christ's first coming uh, and living as if he had already come. Uh, But you also see uh, this, uh, this kind of same problem in the New Testament for instance, with the Apostle Paul, who's trying to educate the Christians to live as though Christ had already come again. Again, yeah. Yeah, because either way, whether you were waiting for the first coming or the second coming, you're still waiting. To live a Christian life is to not live as someone who's waiting, but to live as someone who 
uh, is already uh, already finds themselves in the full light of that promised redemption. Yeah, yeah. There was only a small sliver of people that ever were there temporarily with Jesus Christ, uh, and even them with even, even they're all standing around with Jesus saying, "When is this going to happen?" Yeah, and Jesus yeah. keeps telling them, "This is it. It's yeah. happening right here. The yeah. kingdom is right here." Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, thanks, Adam. I look forward to talking with you more about that uh, coming up. And I appreciate you taking the time to meet today on the Maxwell Institute podcast. My pleasure. As promised at the top of the episode, here's a special little mini episode with Janice Johnson, a research associate in the Willis Center for Book of Mormon Studies here at the Maxwell Institute. I'm sitting here at the Maxwell Institute with Janice Johnson. She's one of the scholars here currently working under the Willis Center for Book of Mormon Studies. Janice, nice to see you. Hi, Blair. Nice to see you, too. And the other day we were talking and you were talking a little bit about a project that you're working on and I thought it would be cool for you to tell the listeners a little bit about it and they might be able to help you out with something. Yes, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I am working on, as a research associate at the Willis Center, I am working on early Book of Mormon reception history. I'm particularly interested in how the Book of Mormon became scripture for early Mormons. And one of the things that I'm interested in is seeing the material records, seeing what Books of Mormon uh, tell us about how they used the books. You just said Books of Mormon. You, you're taking a stand on that locution? <laughs> yeah, is that your... That, that, is, my, that is my stand, <laughs> Books of okay. Mormon. So you want to see how people are receiving Books of Mormon? <laughs> um, how they received the Book of Mormon individually, and then Copies later, per, later perhaps yeah. receive multiple books of Mormon. <laughs> but um, as a scholar, I need to see multiples, <laughs> yes, um, to be able to establish and kind of understand how how they're using the text. And you mean like really how they're actually not just using the text in terms of the words, but even the physical text itself. Right, um, the physical text. Some people I have seen write page numbers in the fly leaves trying to mark specific things that they want to remember. Um, the format of the book, at least um, in the early, uh, until the late 19th century, is a narrative. It's not split up into shorter chapters and verses as we're used to it. And so I'm really interested in what these books could tell us about. One of my stumbling blocks here is that um, archives generally want to collect pristine copies. Um, they are sometimes, if a copy is interesting, they will uh, collect a copy that has been used, um, well used and loved, but many times they're looking at at collecting pristine copies, and that doesn't help me so much. Yeah, you can't really tell how they were using it because there's no marking. <laughs> exactly. No, you know. it's It hasn't been used at all. It's just been sitting on a shelf. That's why it's still in pristine shape. Um, so, so if you I, have one of those, just get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, no, you can still, I'll take that too. <laughs> but um, I am really interested if anyone has um, family copies uh, that have been in their family from the 19th century. So really any copies from the 19th century, I would be interested in looking at. Um, and this and isn't a purchasing thing. This is like a, a work of scholarship where you just want to see these yes, copies so you can I, investigate I, them. I just want to see them and be able to um, investigate and examine how um, what signs of use are in the book itself. And so if any of our listeners out there have um, an inclination and something um, lurking on their family bookshelves, um, I would love to see that. Great. Uh, do you recommend they just send you an email, or how would you prefer they get a hold yeah, of you? Yeah, just send me an email. You can find my contact info. You m might want to be sure you spell my name right, but my contact info is on the Maxwell Institute's website. You're also on Twitter as well? Yes, yes. I could take messages that what's your way, at, too. What's your at on there? I don't remember. Um, it's just Janice Johnson. Okay. I'm not very creative. Yeah, well, that's cool that you got that, though. You're lucky. Yeah. Like, I'd, I'd love to have at Blair Hodges. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Janice. It was good talking to you, and hopefully someone can uh, find something of use for you. Thank you. And thank you.
P.S. For those of you keeping score at home, this is actually the third interview that Adam's had on the Maxwell Institute podcast. We'll see you next time.